Aloha, good morning everybody. Welcome to our Marketing in Korea seminar. Thank you very much for being here. My name is Rob Hack. I'm the moderator today. I'm from the Hawaii Pacific Export Council on the board there. We call that HPEC. Of, uh, HPEC is a district export council of which there are 61 district export councils in the country. We are just one of those covering Hawaii, Guam, and the Northern Mariana Islands. We uh, are a nonprofit here based in Honolulu here at the Foreign Trade Zone. We are charged with helping companies export from Hawaii, and so we run programs, uh, seminars, one, which is one of these that uh, you're here today. We do roughly one seminar a month and lots and lots of one-on-one -on -one company mentoring program. So if you have any questions about exporting, uh, any concerns, we are your go-to organization here. We are able to put on these seminars due to a generous grant we receive from DBET, who in turn receives their grant from SBA in Washington, D.C. It's part of the STEP program, the State Trade Expansion Program. And here in Hawaii, DBET uh, rebrands that to call it High Step for Hawaii State Trade Expansion Program. And uh, with that, I'll bring up Jamie from DBET to say a couple of words. While Jamie is coming up, I'll give our standard disclaimer that uh, you see the cameras here. It means we're recording it for our YouTube channel and uh, we are also live by webinar. So by being here, it's possible that your question, if you ask one, and I hope you do, or your face could be on camera and you could be part of a public forum. So just know that by asking a question. Thank you. Jamie, please. There's a mic in the front. Aloha, good morning everyone. Uh, I'm Jamie Lum with the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. I'm blocking Don't worry, <laughs> and, um, and as Rob uh, already mentioned, um, we are the state uh, a recipient, and we, we really administer it on behalf of the state, of the straight, State Trade Expansion Program uh, funds, or STEP, from the SBA. Um, so we actually have just uh, put in another uh, grant application for another year of funding for uh, 2020. So um, as I make my remarks, I'll, I'll talk about in general what the, what the components of the, the program, um, what the components are, and then try to kind of look ahead a little bit of what we have planned. Again, it's all contingent upon us getting another grant, um, but I can tell you what we have planned. So uh, basically, we have three components of the program, which is our export uh, readiness which of which these seminars are part of um, and we do work with HPEC to put these together um, and then as well as um, on top of the seminars we have uh, we work with partners such as HPEC such as the small business development centers and Lori and Mick are here with us today uh, innovate Hawaii and the Patsy Mink Center to help provide one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, business advising for companies depending on what level you're at where you're at in terms of your export experience um, then we will uh, put you in touch with our various partners um, and, and they can work with you. So that's all part of the export readiness um, program. We also have our Hawaii uh, pavilions in which we select various trade shows to go into and we um, buy the space and then we recruit companies to go into that particular show. Uh, we have been basically selecting shows that uh, can um, encompass a lot of different types of, of companies. So we haven't really done industry specific other than the biotech that we do because we don't do very much for our technology industry in Hawaii. So that's the one show that we have been doing for many years. Um, so many of you have gone to several of our trade shows. Um, one that is coming up in September, the Tokyo International Gift Show, which is uh, probably the largest show that we do organize um, that is coming up. And so uh, we have those throughout the year. Um, I can tell you next year we are um, looking at doing the uh, same trade shows that we have been doing, um, uh, TIGS, um, 
uh, Surf Expo, the outdoor retailer, uh, biotech show. We also uh, have put into our plans, and uh, again, I just want to remind you that this, this is all contingent upon us getting another grant. Um, there have been a lot of companies that have wanted to go into the Natural Products Expo West in um, Anaheim in March. It's a very large show, and um, we may have to tailor it a little differently. We um, probably because of the, the space, we can't get space in the convention center, and they've expanded out to neighboring um, hotels. So um, depending on the kind of space that we can get, we might not be able to have the same kind of um, pavilion concept that we've had in other shows. But um, you know, anyway, we'll, we'll see what happens with that. But that is uh, one of the new shows that we'd like to do uh, based on a lot of the uh, comments that we've gotten from many of our companies. Um, so we do, and we, what we do is we pay for all the costs, and then we assess companies a participation fee. And basically, I would say it costs about a third of what you would spend if you went into a trade show as an individual company. So hopefully, that will help companies in, in being able to uh, get more exposure for you know their products outside of Hawaii. The last component, and um, I like to call up my colleague uh, Mark Ritchie, uh, is the company assistance. And um, I see several of you in the audience that have received that in the past. So uh, that is something that we will continue to do. And um, we'll have Mark talk about. Here's your website if you want. Ah, OK, great. OK. Yeah, thank you, Jamie. Um, you just want to spend uh, just two minutes on the individual assistance component, which is sort of the third leg of our STEP program. And what that's designed to do is to give financial assistance to companies that uh, have an export development plan and they want to help subsidize like, a trade show that they're going into overseas. It could also be extensive buyer meetings that they're going to be going into overseas. In order to apply for this money, usually by usually by Thanksgiving, we have we have to do it through an <coughs> excuse me an RFP process, and that usually is posted around Thanksgiving or the beginning of December, and then your application is actually due in. Uh, uh, first thing in uh, January, kind of mid-January. And the things we ask companies for are to have a well-developed export development plan for that year that you're asking for the financial assistance for. And the reason I'm coming up now to start talking is if you are working on your export development plan, that might be something that you want to make sure that you sort of have that ready by November. And the Small Business Development Center has been very helpful uh, to companies on one-on-one -on -one mentoring, and then also HPEC, and then also at DBED, um, more than happy to sort of give you comments or try to help with that. Another requirement is we expect companies to have a minimum revenue of uh, $200,000 a year for this assistance, and the reason we put that in there is in order to really make the most of this money, you have to have some skin in the game and be able to sustain the export development plan. Some companies, you know, that are at 50,000 or 100,000, we don't want you to get into financial trouble because it takes, you know, sometimes a couple years to really be successful in export markets. So look on our website around November, and we'll probably have that that posted uh, if you're interested in applying for the financial assistance. You can use the financial assistance to pay for a pavilion, but what the committee, the evaluation committee, is really looking for is the fact that you're sort of going into other trade shows that are not already subsidized by the state. So, and I'll be around if anybody has any questions on this component. Do you want me to introduce uh, Yukashi? Or Please. Uh, Yukashi Smith from the Department of Ag would like to talk to you now about a number of missions and some things that they are doing, and one of them involves Korea. So I'll give it to Yukashi. Thank you, Mark. Uh, hi, good morning, everybody. I'm Yukashi Smith from Hawaii Department of Agriculture. I have a flyer this, uh, I hope you picked up at the front desk. If you don't, please pick up this one. So this is, uh, uh, today's seminar is about marketing in Korea, and I thought this is a good timing to uh, announce we have an uh, event coming up, uh, Inba Mission from Korea, um, which means we're gonna bring uh, food buyers from Korea, like uh, five people are coming. And you don't have to travel to Korea, but you, you have an opportunity to meet with the food buyers. 
here in this um, conference room in, on August 1 and 2. And also we have an ASEAN Inba mission. Same thing, uh, we will be bringing five buyers from East, uh, Southeast Asia, including Singapore, um, Vietnam, Cambodia, those uh, people. And this is gonna be held at the Made in Hawaii Festival. I, I'm sure the food manufacturers gonna be there. So it's gonna be at the Made in Hawaii Festival, uh, August 16 and 17. And Inba Mission is uh, good for the first time to, or new to market companies. But after you experience Inba Mission, if you wanna see the market, we have uh, it's called Outbound Mission. Uh, we are conducting Alba mission to Seoul and Busan uh, September 30th to Thursday, uh, October 3rd. So that week, uh, instead of bringing buyers, we are um, taking Hawaii companies, uh, uh, US companies to Korea to meet with uh, potential buyers over there. And you can do the market <coughs> tour. Uh, the ATO Seoul people is gonna do the briefing. So this is funded by USDA's um, market access program. Uh, this funding is um, secured by the Farm Bill. So we have five year Farm Bill passed last year. So we are, we are good uh, for five years, but I would like to encourage everybody to take uh, advantage of the funding, you know, uh, still is available. So uh, <coughs> as well as step program that's really assisting Hawaii companies, I believe. So uh, those inbound missions uh, from Korea, ASEAN, and outbound missions flyer is out there, and just let me know if you have any questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Arigato. These WUSADA programs, if you're an ag company or at all related to ag, these WUSADA programs are fantastic. They bring buyers here and all you have to do is show up. Uh, it's really a fantastic program. They're usually in this room and it costs something like 10 or $15 to register and you meet five or six pre-qualified buyers from the countries that are of question. It's a, it's a very uh, great program as well as these outbound missions. So thank you very much Yukashi for that. Before we move on, I just wanted to show you very quickly, a few websites um, to look at when you have time related to exporting. This is the DBET website here, and you would click on the exporting tab. It's invest.hawaii.gov is their, their main page, and then at exporting, you have the high step program here, and this is where you can register. I'm sure most of you are already registered to receive emails about these programs, but Nonetheless, um, this is a very good website. It talks about the trade shows that Jamie was referring to. Secondly, um, this is the video archive of uh, the seminars that we've done for the Hawaii Pacific Export Council. So a seminar such as this one today, this is our archive here. And um, I'll point out um, the one on agriculture that Yukashi did uh, last December was great and it's very, uh, focused on um, obviously exporting of agricultural products, but we've done seminars on a wide variety of topics, including legal, finance, intellectual property. This is marketing in Korea. We've done, um, I think, some very good programs on marketing in Japan uh, and what have you. So please have a look at that. Um, uh, last year, I started doing a show on the Think Tech network called Exporting from Hawaii, where I bring in some people. I see some of my guests uh, are here. Um, there's one right there for Diamond Bakery, so thank you for doing that. But this is a great program and another resource on exporting, so please have a look at that. Then finally, before we jump into Korea, I just brought up the uh, website for the U.S. Embassy and Consulate in South Korea. So please have a look at that, keep an eye on that. And um, there's lots of really good information on here. Okay, so with that, I'd like to jump in and introduce our panelists for today. Um, as I mentioned, uh, I'm Rob, most people here know me already, but we have uh, Bill Oberlin, please raise your hand. Bill um, is a former uh, Boeing executive 
uh, in Korea. He was president of Boeing Korea, and it was um, the chairman of the American Chamber of Commerce in Korea. We're lucky to have him. He's also on the Hawaii Pacific Export Council board, as I am, and he's a fantastic resource on issues of Korea. Then next to him is Pat Gaines. He was also uh, incredibly active as chairman of the American Chamber of Commerce in Korea. And you're living here full time? Half time. Half time. Great. So thank you for being here. Uh, then on the line is Tom uh, Penansky. He's actually calling in from the east coast of the U.S., but he spent the bulk of his career as an attorney based in Seoul. So we'll have him speaking shortly. We have yeah, Ryan. I'm, in, I'm still very active. Oh. Still, yeah, still a part of the in Seoul, but I'm in, in the U.S. right now. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. And then Ryan, I saw pop in. You can sit up here if you want. Ryan is from UPS. He's going to be uh, speaking about logistics to Korea later. And then we have uh, Adrian Stover. He's an international trade specialist uh, with an, an expertise in Korea. He's um, with the U.S. Department of Commerce, the International Trade Administration. He's in Washington, D.C., and he'll be online soon giving a presentation about Korea. So with that, did you want to say anything, or should we jump right into Adrian? I'll just start talking. Please. E use your... This is Bill Oberlin again. Thank you. Uh, how first of all, how many people have uh, been to Korea? Please raise your hand. Okay, we'll cut this in half then. Um, <clears throat> you know, actually, when I um, I was in the Air Force beforehand, and then I went to work for Boeing, and I had spent all of my time uh, studying and living and working in Southeast Asia. And then Boeing hired me, Boeing Helicopters hired me, and they said, we want to send you to Korea. And I said, I know nothing about the Korea. And uh, my boss said, doesn't make any difference, Asia is Asia. That shows you just how little they knew about Korea. So I wish I had had a um, presentation like this back in those days because they put me on an airplane. They gave me a Dash 1 for a Chinook helicopter, which I was selling, which Pat used to fly. and. Um, and then I inter introduced me to my sales consultants in Korea who turned out to be idiots and thieves at the same time. So it was like <clears throat> earn as you learn, um, but we were eventually were successful. Uh, next slide. Um, Rob uh, obviously has introduced himself, and um, he's fantastic. He's a, actually, I would say, um, a... From a Hawaii Pacific Export Council perspective, he keeps us all together and keeps us honest. Um, I'm going to say a few words, and then Adrian is going to give us a very comprehensive um, overview of uh, South Korea. Pat uh, was going to talk about uh, doing business and probably a little bit of cleanup uh, from what we haven't talked about. Tom will talk about the legal side, and I think this is becoming very, very important. Um, in Korea these days and, and actually throughout Asia. And Tom can help us with that. Ryan is going to give us the um, ABC's Exporting 101. And then if there are any questions uh, left, then we'll uh, have a Q&A period of time. The, um, if you could just kind of wait until the end of the presentation, the individual presentations or discussions, and then ask questions. And then at the end, if, um, we'll open it up to uh, uh, any questions we, you still have. Everybody knows the miracle on the Han is amazing. I remember I took a, um, a Boeing guy who had uh, never been to, uh, had, last time he had been in Korea was during the Korean War. We're landing at um, then Incheon, or no, excuse me, at Kimpo. And I pointed out the airport, the airport from the airplane, and he said, you have got to be kidding me. And that's really um, from what happened from the war onward. Uh, I first got there in 1985, and I was last there a couple of years ago. And even in the few number of years that I was away, I'm still absolutely amazed at what has uh, transpired, especially in C as you can see in the, in the Seoul, Seoul, Incheon area. 
I bring up the geostrategic, and it's only because of the fact that if we're talking about marketing, marketing in Korea, you never talk about it. But when somebody says Korea these days here in the United States, what are you going to talk about? You're going to talk about the geostrategic, what's going on between the United States, the DPRK, North Korea, and the relationship between uh, South Korea, the Republic of Korea, and North Korea. I would, <clears throat> if, if you're really interested and want to know what um, North Korea is like and what Kim Jong-un is like, then I recommend you read, as I am reading right now, Anna Fifield's book. Uh, it just came out a couple months ago, and it's called The Great Successor, and the subtitle is The Divinely Perfect Destiny of Brilliant Comrade Kim Jong-un, and that's probably um, one of his shorter introductions. But um, U.S. DPRK uh, relations, people used to ask me, I also spent a period of time when I was on a, I guess you could say, a Boeing sabbatical where I was the, now they call it the CEO of AmCham Korea. I had been there for like um, a month and North Korea announced that they were going to turn Seoul into a sea of fire. I got interviewed by the Korea Times and the next day uh, on the front page it said, Oberlin says Korea is safe. Well, first of all, nobody knew who Oberlin was, but, um, <clears throat> but I, from, a, from living and working there for uh, over two decades, when you talk about the relationship between the North and the South, um, it's really pretty far from your mind, uh, unlike what you all hear in the United States. Is there, is there an impact from a business point of view? Yes. Do you see it? No. Should you worry about it? From my point of view, absolutely not. And so I just wanted to get at least my thoughts on that out of the way early. In fact, all the time I was there, I think I only had one instance where the relationship between where I was living and North Korea even came into, into question. U.S. presence, right now there's like 25,000, roughly 25,000 uh, U.S. troops still stationed in Korea. They will remain there. Uh, no indication they're going to leave. And when I first got there in 85, there were like 45,000. The troops there today are um, highly capable, highly technical. Uh, they are no longer as many up on the border as what there were before. They're all pulled back into the Pyongyang area, Camp Humphreys. Um, and, 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 and that's a good thing too. But are they effective in what they're doing? Absolutely. Um, as we used to say, and they probably still refer to it, uh, U.S. troops in, in Korea are a tripwire. In other words, when the balloon goes up, um, and I used to do this in the Pentagon, spent all our time working on plans and uh, policies on how, you're, how we were going to get all of the other troops um, into Korea as quickly as possible. Actually, U.S. Forces Korea is a subset of, of PACOM, which you all are familiar with. Next slide. Korean consumers. Globe trotting, obviously because of the fact that you see um, Koreans on the streets of Waikiki all the time. Sophisticated from a consumer point of view. Uh, obviously fashion savvy and trendsetters. And this was true definitely uh, a few years ago and I'm sure it's true today. Many companies, uh, US and, and uh, Western companies will use Korean customers as a, as a test bed. If you go to some of the big um, supermarkets, um, department stores in Seoul, you may find that there's a brand of cosmetics that is for sale to Koreans, but they're only for sale to Koreans because the manufacturer wants to see exactly the response that they're going to get from the, the Korean consumers before they decide then to sell to Japan, to uh, China, et cetera. So it, it um, as I said, uh, very fashion savvy, trend setting, and sophisticated. They're strongly, obviously, home team um, uh, oriented, but on the other hand, uh, they're especially interested in high quality, upscale foreign products. 
and or unique products like Hawaiian. In other words, if it's got uh, Hawaii stamped on it, uh, that means something special to them, especially these days when uh, many, many Koreans have already visited or will visit and will come back to uh, Hawaii. Next slide, please. Korea wants. Difficult one is behind me. Uh, technology, obviously. It used to be, and it's not true anymore, um, that a Hyundai car uh, paid, excuse me, Hyundai paid more royalty fees on that car than any other automobile in, in the world. Um, they want the technology. Now they're developing their own technology. Services, innovation, obviously, as I said before, quality products, education, and investment, always investment. Now, you're going to find the Korean government is very, very supportive, and you're going to hear more about this uh, later, but uh, very su uh, supportive of foreign direct investment, especially greenfield investment. That's really not what we're talking about here. But you're going to find that the Korean government is supportive of just about every aspect of foreign commercial involvement in Korea. And that's a positive. And, it, and that's something that really came about um, because of the Asian financial crisis, which in Korea is called the uh, IMF crisis, where Korea opened up. And when they opened up, they opened up big time, and you can thank um, Kim Dae-jung for that. Next slide, please. Many people use Korea as kind of a launch pad to Asia. I said before, for example, testing products for one. But on the other hand, uh, if you take a look at the relationships that have been established between Korean companies, Koreans, and throughout Asia, for example, China, Indonesia, Vietnam, big, big time in Vietnam, Malaysia, uh, and now moving to like Myanmar and, and India, your Korean businesses, Korean companies are there. So the point is, if you ha establish a relationship with a Korean company, you may find your you may find that as an avenue to another uh, nation in Asia as well. Excellent logistics infrastructure capability. Uh, they have three, I lose count, three um, um, three zones. Yeah. yeah, and I think they have also special uh, special economic zones. Uh, as well that are available and it, they'll be more than happy to talk to you about it. Um, obviously a supportive and capable financial sector. Last time I gave this presentation I had a banker with me so he talked about that. Um, trade, organ, uh, trade oriented legal regulatory re regime uh, much much improved from what it used to be a long time ago and as I said partnering with a Korean company or a Korean entity uh, can give you access to other markets as well. Next slide, please. I won't go into great detail on this. Other people can talk about it from the resources that are available. I would comment that even if you Google marketing in Korea, you're going to find a lot of sources. Uh, obviously, the U.S. government uh, commercial service is one of them, but there's lots of other doc interesting documents that are available one of them I read, which made a very, very good point, and it's why I uh, talk about Google. Uh, the writer said, of the old adage that if you're going to go global, and, and which means you're going to export someplace outside the United States, then you also have to go local. And the writer made the comment, said, but from a Korean point of view, if you're going to go local, do it right, because it, if you don't get it right, it can have a negative impact upon you. And that uh, an example of that is uh, translations. Be very, very careful about using Korean translate, uh, <coughs> English to Korean translations. Make sure that you've got somebody who knows the indus industry, knows the technical terms, knows all of that good stuff. Because if it's not well written in Korean, it can easily be shut down by whoever is seeing it, reading it, etc. So what's the alternative? English. Don't worry about it. In other words, if you can't get it perfect, um, I'll
could tell you a story of, about how I learned that the hard way early on back when I was selling Chinooks. Um, but anyway, Google is a, is a good source. And as I said, um, and as Rob pointed out, U.S. Commercial Service Embassy is there to help you, um, AmCham, and from in-country advisors, banks, etc. It's, <coughs> it's fantastic compared to what it was about 30 years ago. And finally, caution. <clears throat> I will mention this because it was in the background of everything I did all the time when I was there, and it should be something that you should be uh, fully aware of. Remember, you're a foreign entity. Excuse me. You are not a foreign entity. You are a U.S. citizen. You are a U.S. company, and you fall under U.S. rules in the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Um, applies in your case. So if you haven't read it um, and you're thinking about exporting to Korea, make sure you, you can go online, you can read it, you can understand it, um, and it's don't fall for the, you know, well, that's not the way it's done in Korea, that's not the way it's done here. It doesn't make any difference. It's the way it's done in the United States is the way we must be behave and act when we're in Korea and selling to Korea. So when in doubt, ask. And there's more than many, many people that are uh, willing to help you in that particular area. And that's all I have. If you have any questions, if not, we're going to proceed on to a more comprehensive discussion of, of um, some of the things I just talked about and others. OK. Any, any questions for Bill before we move to Adrian Stover's presentation? Okay. Adrian, are you here? I am here. Aloha. Great. Great. Um, you're on a speaker, so if you could just go rather slowly and loudly that would be great and tell me just give me a quick signal when to switch slides for you sure so no absolutely please proceed uh, thank you of course absolutely so aloha everybody aloha um, uh, I'm, i definitely wish i could be there in beautiful hawaii um i think it's perfect that i'm i'm seeing people on the screen wearing hawaiian shirts and looking very comfortable i'm sitting here in a suit so uh, <laughs> Je very jealous of that. Uh, but anyway, so hello, my name is Adrian Stover. I am the desk officer for Korea at the at Commerce Department in Washington, D.C. Uh, as the title of my presentation suggests, I'm going to tell you about South Korea, uh, specifically resources available through uh, the part of commerce that I work in, uh, the International Trade Administration. Uh, just a little bit about me, uh, I, as my title suggests, I sit at a desk in Washington, hence the term desk officer, um, and uh, deal with uh, trade policy issues um, with Korea most of the time. So I spend a lot of time looking at uh, Korean regulations and whether or not those are barriers to, uh, to U.S. exports. Uh, my favorite story about that, actually, uh, from the 90s that I heard, was that apparently back in the 90s, if you were a Korean citizen and you were uh, filling out your tax return, you had to check a box that said you either owned a Korean car or an imported car. If you checked the box that said you owned an imported car, you got audited. So, you know, we, uh, I have in my presentation hold for laughs. I don't know, I can't tell if anybody's laughing, but um, uh, it, it, we, can't, we managed to change that. Uh, and we're, you know, we're working, certainly uh, working on other things as well. Uh, but I'm certainly a part of a larger uh, family at the Department of Commerce that includes uh, John Pullman, uh, who's our local representative from, for the department in, uh, in Hawaii. So he should be your first point of contact for uh, kind of any, uh, getting any kind of um, access to the resources through, uh, through us. So just want to give out a quick, uh, quick plug for John. Um, and he has, he sh uh, he's able to connect with people like me or uh, any of our commercial service folks uh, in Korea or kind of throughout throughout the world. Um, 
And so even though we have different day-to-day -day roles in different locations all around, uh, we're all working to help U.S. companies export and do business in, uh, in the world. Uh, next slide. Uh, so as the, just an overview of the presentation I have today, I'll tell you a little bit about the South Korean economy as a whole and kind of some, um, some general uh, figures that we kind of look at. Um, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about some, uh, some key industry sectors. I'll tell you a little bit about the free trade agreement that we have with Korea. Um, and uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about our team in Seoul in South Korea at the, uh, the U.S. Embassy, um, who are great. Uh, and they're so great, I actually stole the format for this presentation from them. So uh, it's a, just a quick note about how great, great they are. Uh, next slide. Uh, so just to kind of give you, uh, uh, just kind of give you an understanding of some of the stuff that we look at in terms of looking at a different market. We certainly look at population sizes or GDP per capita, or kind of what they rank as in terms of the export market. They are the seventh largest. Um, two numbers I actually kind of look at that I think are kind of maybe tell, capture kind of uh, the, the market as it, as it of itself. Um, there's the World Bank Ease of Doing Business Rankings. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you might be with these rankings that come out uh, every year, but they have things like um, how easy is it to sign a contract, how easy is it to get uh, connected to electricity, get connected to the internet. Um, and Korea has traditionally done uh, very, very, very well on these. Um, they are number five in the world. Um, so just to give you some additional context, uh, New Zealand is the easiest place uh, to do business in the world. They come in number one. Uh, number two is Singapore. Number three is Denmark. Uh, number eight is the United States, and number 46 is China. Um, and there's another number that we, it's kind of interesting to look at is the uh, transparency ranking from the Transparency International. And they take a look at corruption and how easy is it uh, to find regulations online, how basically transparent, as their name suggests, um, a government is. And that's 45. Um, and so that kind of tells you something. I mean, it kind of tells you that, yes, certain things are easy to do in business um, in, uh, in the country. But, you know, other things like yeah, finding out uh, what different regulations are can be a bit more of a challenge. Um, so next slide. Adrian, this is Rob. Before we move on, I'd just like to jump in here and say that we have the population of Korea is listed as 52 million. But yeah. I think we can't... Uh, overstate the relevance of the capital city Seoul in that we don't have a city like this in the United States that is such a big part of the overall country so that if there's 52 million people in Korea, roughly half of those people are in the general metropolitan area of Seoul. It's, a, it's, a, it's one of the mega cities of the world, um, but Culturally uh, and business-wise and uh, from a media standpoint and whatever, Seoul, the importance of Seoul in, the, in Korea cannot be uh, overstated, as I said. So when you fly to Korea, you're almost for sure going to fly into Seoul. Um, you sort of can't avoid it if you wanted to. Um, but it's nice. It's a big, big, big city, sprawling city, but quite a clean city, especially for a mega city. It's easy to get around. Um, you can rent a car if you want and drive on the right side of the road. You could take the subways and the trains. There's a high speed train now through Korea. So it's quite easy to actually get around Korea compared to the days when I lived there and you had to rent a car. Um, now I find when I go to Korea, I can get around by train and subway and things very, very easily and very reasonably priced. There's domestic flights as well too, but you don't necessarily need those domestic flights as much as you used to. So I would just leave it at that. that let, uh, let's just, don't forget about Seoul. No, absolutely. That's a that's actually a really good point. Um, you know, obviously we have the U.S. Embassy in Seoul, and we also have a consulate in uh, Busan in the south. Uh, but our entire office is in Seoul. Um, we actually don't have any uh, commerce staff in, in Busan. So, anyway, uh, moving on, um, just to kind of give you a uh, kind of just a quick uh, look at something we look at here in Washington on a daily basis. Uh, you know, one 
big uh, priority for the, this administration has been bringing down the trade deficit or kind of the balance between how much uh, the U.S. exports versus uh, imports. Um, and so the trade deficit uh, with uh, Korea has fallen in recent years. Um, and we're also working on attracting investment into the United States as well. Um, we have, uh, not last week, but the week before, we just had our big uh, Select USA Summit. Um, and uh, Ambassador Harris, you probably saw on the screen earlier, uh, just led the largest Korean delegation to, uh, to that summit. Um, and they are big investors in the United States. Uh, Ambassador Harris and our Secretary of Commerce, Wilbur Ross, have been to um, uh, plant openings in Georgia and Tennessee and, um, and all, all over the place. Uh, we even had just had a, a big one, a $3.3 billion one in, um, in Louisiana as well. Um, so if you're interested in attracting foreign investment into, uh, into the United States, that's something we work on, we work on as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, I actually pulled this, uh, pulled the data from this uh, the other day because I was just curious. Um, but uh, it's, it's a good reminder that it, a lot of uh, data on um, exports and trade goods and uh, everything that's kind of flowing around the world, um, it's all online. That's all, uh, it all comes from the, the Census Bureau that tracks all this stuff. So. I was curious as to what the top U.S. exports to Korea were from, uh, from Hawaii, and I think a lot of this stuff might be trans-shipped um, from the mainland to, uh, to Hawaii and elsewhere, but it was kind of just interesting to take a look and a good reminder that a lot of this stuff is uh, online and available for free. Uh, next slide. Uh, so uh, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the free trade agreement we have with South Korea. It is called CORUS for short. Um, it's interesting to point out that uh, while we don't have free trade agreements with some of our biggest trading partners, such as Japan or China, um, we do have uh, a free trade agreement with South Korea, and I'll kind of give you an overview of what that means for, um, for uh, Next slide. Uh, so the history of this is actually goes back to uh, that spans three presidents. Um, I think it was first uh, negotiated between the United States and Korea between, uh, under President Bush, um, and then it came into force uh, uh, in March 2012 during the Obama administration. And then last year there was a considerable amount of time spent uh, re-amending the, uh, the trade agreement. Um, so what what does this mean? So before uh, Chorus, uh, the US, Korea U.S. Trade agreement. Only about 14% of all um, imports coming into uh, Korea from the United States uh, were duty free. Uh, so they faced no tariffs or border taxes or anything like that. Um, and the average uh, tariff or tax on those on U.S. products was 11.5%. Um, so as of January 1st, 2018, 92% of U.S. products enter Korea duty free. Um, and uh, it's been a big part of our free trade agreement policy to kind of bring uh, bring those uh, bring taxes on U.S. products down. And it's uh, the only reason why it's uh, 92 percent um, last year and this year is because there's you know phased uh, phased outcome free trade agreement. So by 2022, 99 um, percent of U.S. U.S. products will pay uh, zero duties um, at the entry of the market. I know that. Nice, nice little graph with a nice big red arrow uh, down there as well. Um, next. Uh, there are still, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, there are still some challenges with the free trade agreement. A lot of actually what was uh, negotiated last year uh, was just further access in the automotive market for, um, for U.S. products. Um, a lot of what was, nego was talked about and negotiated was getting more vehicles that don't necessarily have to meet um, Korean uh, emission standards um, and other kind of uh, products um, that went into those negotiations. Um, how to talk about that um, a little bit more, but that was kind of the bulk of what, um, a bulk of what into that, went into that agreement and went into those discussions. Um, one thing I'll talk about uh, is uh, Customs. Um, customs is much stricter than uh, the U.S. customs, and uh, it's certainly something that a lot of our folks in Seoul and a lot of our folks in U.S. embassies around the world spend a lot of time on. Um, so U.S. companies do have to be a little more prepared in terms uh, in terms of verification. Uh, 
Um, next slide. Uh, just a quick plug for navigating customs under uh, under Boris. I, I would say if the biggest thing I can say about this slide actually is if you're having problem with customs in, in Korea, come talk to us. Um, it's certainly something that we spend a lot of time focusing on, a lot of time that we can help. Um, you'd be actually be surprised how much time uh, a lot of our embassy staff spends overseas trying to get stuff like stuck out of out of customs. So. If that's, that's something that's, uh, that's come up, please, uh, please come back to us. Uh, next slide. I, before we move on to the next slide, I, I, we have to cover this because we've covered this in other seminars too, knowing your HS code. That's extremely important. Please don't ship a product without knowing what your HS code is because that's going to cause you all kinds of trouble. It doesn't matter if you're shipping it to Korea or anywhere else, but we, we, we do field questions like this um, from people who have shipped product without properly knowing what the HS code is, and I'm sure you, you, you know very well from a UPS standpoint. Okay, thank you. No, of course, absolutely, and yeah, no, it's, um, there's usually a, a significant paper trail that our folks overseas usually have to follow whenever they have to find something and get it, um, uh, get it out of the customer. Anyway, um, so uh, one actually one tool you can use in terms of like figuring out what uh, what tariff your product might face, um, which requires knowing your HS codes, um, is uh, finding out um, what, what my tariff. Uh, so you can use a couple different resources. You can go online and use um, uh, the FTA tariff tool. is is one that's pretty pretty simple um, and has a little kind of video instruction to figure out how to how to navigate that, um, but no, uh, again, uh, resources that are available for you. Uh, next. Uh, so uh, I'll talk a little bit about key industry sectors. Um, and actually, next slide. Let's go right into it. Um, there's a lot. Um, it's certainly, uh, there's certainly a lot of, like, there's certainly a big markets for a lot of different uh, US products in, uh, in Korea. My uh, biggest suggestion actually would be um, if you Google our country commercial guide, um, it's just Google country commercial guide, it, it should pop up. We have one for Korea and it's great. It's written by all of our local specialists um, who, work, who work for us in Seoul and it goes into detail with all the kind of leading um, sectors uh, that, are, that are available for, for products, for US products in, uh, in Korea. So, no matter what, uh, depending on depending on what business uh, you're involved in, I would say go online and look, look at that and see if there's uh, see if there's a market um, in Korea. And um, it, they're pretty extensive and uh, they're updated every year. Um, I refer to them a lot, um, and uh, they're really really one of the best resources I think we have. Um, so again, it's the plug for our uh, our country commercial guide for Korea. Can I, can I interrupt very quickly and say yes, the Korea guide, in my opinion, is one of the better ones that I've uh, read from the U.S. Commercial Service. It's very detailed and they do update it uh, every year, as Adrian said. It's a very, very good guide. Um, I would also point out that on this list right here where Hawaii companies can do really well, it's cosmetics, environmental products, um, certainly travel and tourism, agriculture, um, but I, I would point people towards cosmetics because I think cosmetics is a broad term, but I do believe we have a lot of growth available from our manufacturers here in terms of um, lotions and sunscreens and oils and all kinds of things that are very important in the Korean market. But the Korean market is also becoming very organic oriented uh, and, and those types of products. So um, I think that several of our companies here could do very, very well in the Korean market. Please, Adrian, go ahead. No, absolutely. Um, just I, I, because I have it in front of me right now, uh, South Korea is the eighth largest cosmetics market in the world, representing 3% uh, of the global market. Wow. Um, so then I'm just reading that verbatim off the, uh, the country commercial guide. So another, another plug for that. Um, and uh, there, it's, it's really actually fascinating just to kind of go online and start poking through it. There's all kinds of stuff about what the political and economic environment is. There's a whole guide on just selling U.S. products and services, um, 
uh, you know, whole chapters on e-commerce. There's there's lots of lots of different stuff on here that I would very much encourage you to uh, check it out. Uh, and I know the people that who write them, and I can certainly vouch for them. So anyway, uh, let's see. Uh, that's, uh, next slide. So that's a perfect um, segue. Uh, just to kind of quickly go into uh, the, our, our staff uh, in Korea. Um, so we actually have five officers um, and a team of local specialists in Seoul at the U.S. Embassy. Um, as I said before, we don't have anybody in, in Busan, but most of the, the, the business uh, goes on in Seoul anyway, so I kind of see where um, we're getting geographically located. Um, and they do everything from working on uh, supporting the U.S. ambassador when he meets with companies. Um, they work on all the uh, business facilitation services that we offer um, and a range of, um, of other activities. I mean, something they're doing right now is they're actually working on the uh, 4th of July celebrations uh, that the, the embassies around the world uh, put on every single year. And that's a great, actually, a great way to showcase um, uh, American products and uh, ingenuity. Um, you know, I went, I went, I was in Seoul um, last year actually for, for one of those, and it was great. They had, they had a Tesla car, and they had American ice cream, um, and they had all these great products kind of um, around this, in this part of the celebration. Um, so, well, Taiba, yeah, uh, Taiba, how can we get Hawaii products in that celebration? Then? Uh, I think there were some. I think there was Kona coffee there. Okay, good. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, no, absolutely. Um, I'm a fan of Kona coffee myself, so. Uh, it was, it was uh, glad uh, glad to see that. Um, you know, just the slide that you see in front of you that was actually something uh, that our commercial service folks actually put together um, uh, to kind of capitalize capitalize on the excitement uh, during the Winter Olympics a couple of years ago. Uh, so they put together um, this magazine that you front of, put to you in front of you, uh, Winter Sports USA, um, and they highlighted a lot of U.S. made winter sports products. Um, and they sent that over to uh, over 3,500 Korean readers, emailed 20,000 contacts, um, and targeting um, uh, a variety of different uh, people, people that they know. Um, so I love the quote that's down here. Pretty cool magazine. I can't read most of the stuff, but they look great and very impressive. Um, Kinderlip was actually one of the companies featured in the magazine. Um, so it's just funny that they put that there because the magazine was in Korean. Um, you know, uh, Bill Oberlin uh, uh, alluded to earlier, uh, translation is very important. So, uh, but no, that's uh, it's perfect, uh, perfect case study of the type of work that our commercial service officers um, and all of our local specialists um, do as well. Uh, next slide. Um, kind of further going into that, um, a lot of what we can do, you can actually find online if you Google um, commercial service Korea um, uh, and just look at the list of services they offer. We offer everything from partner searches um, to just kind of counseling. If you're going to Korea in business, ask for a meeting. Um, it's, it's very simple. It can certainly, um, it's certainly something we can do. Uh, market research on firms, kind of doing the, any kind of the basic due diligence check is, checks if you're interested in, in doing business with a, with a potential partner. Um, advocacy, if you're interested in actually, if you're interested in um, selling um, goods and services to the Korean government, we can certainly um, uh, work on uh, advocacy um, or kind of an official uh, plug uh, from either the ambassador or someone else. Um, uh, we can do international buyer programs. That's where we actually bring uh, groups of uh, Korean uh, buyers to uh, to international trade shows, uh, such as Distribute Tech, uh, World of Concrete in Las Vegas, and some other ones as well. Um, and we also work on, on the occasional uh, trade mission, um, which is kind of all of those things really kind of almost combined. But it's a bunch of it's a bunch of different stuff. I think one of our key uh, signature services is something called a gold key, which is uh, as, the, as, the, as, the, as the kind of uh, title suggests, it's a golden key for kind of finding potential potential buyers or distributors. If you're looking for a distributor, um, that we can find you some introductions um, for, uh, for those as well. Um, we actually uh, we sent our, uh, our our Secretary of Commerce Wilbur Ross to Laos a couple of years ago, and he uh, visited a Ford uh, Ford dealership that was set up. Uh, because Ford was looking for um, a distributor for the vehicles in Laos, and so he was able to kind of go and 
um, the, you know, uh, uh, treat a, a very satisfied customer um, over there who was, who was able to buy his first uh, Ford uh, via, via the service. So um, there's other sorts of things. I honestly, I would just encourage you to go online and check out export.gov slash South Korea. I mean, you can also just Google um, uh, commercial service South Korea. I, just, I did that just now. Um, and yeah, there, we have a pretty large team out there. So take advantage of them if you can. Um, let's see, next slide. Uh, just to kind of give a quick plug about where we're located all over the world. I mean, uh, uh, outside of South Korea, we're, we're certainly located in most um, countries and regions around the world. Uh, if we don't have a, a specific post um, set up in a certain country, we have an arrangement with the State Department to work on uh, uh, and offer the same kind of services we would uh, ordinarily. Um, but we're kind of, we have a certainly a global um, a global presence, including John Holman in um, in Hawaii. Uh, next slide. Um, and just kind of further capitalizing on the map, uh, we actually have 105 export assistance centers, including Honolulu, um, throughout the United States, um, and we're overseas in 80 countries. Um, so. Uh, it's certainly, um, certainly a, a big footprint. Uh, oh, and excellent. Uh, so at least this actually happened a couple of years ago, but we uh, we organized a uh, cybersecurity trade mission on, uh, and it went to Korea and it went to Taiwan and, and, and to Japan as well. Um, but it was great. Uh, it was a perfect opportunity for, um, for companies that signed up for this trade mission to um, have uh, introductions to businesses they may want to work with um, in all three countries um, and uh, perfect introductions to the market and um, yeah it went, uh, it's a little it's the slides a little old but it's, it, was, it was a good mission overall um, next slide uh, just for quick contact uh, information um, again uh, John Holman should be your, your first point of contact uh, for working with uh, with anybody, uh, with your gateway at least to the the, the whole um, uh, commercial service overall, um, and then we have um, our we certainly have an office in Korea. And that's their contact information on there as well, and um, yeah, that's about it. Next slide. Gamsa uh, Hamda. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Are there any quick questions for? Adrian, about what we talked about from the commercial service standpoint. Um, yes, um, you, you mentioned uh, food products are um, difficult with customs. Um, uh, a number of us do export food products, and uh, um, a number of us already export to Japan. And that I I personally found that pretty challenging. Could you just um, uh, maybe compare the two markets and, and those challenges? Uh, no, that, that's a very, very good question. Uh, I would actually, uh, if you can send me a quick email, I can uh, certainly look into that for you and try to ask about uh, how things are working in uh, Japan. I, unfortunately, I don't, I don't work on Japan myself, but I can really make a great comparison. But happy to, um, happy to do all of them. I, I, I can interrupt and say, from my experience, shipping to Korea can have, let's say the customs department in Korea has, uh, more power than they probably should, and uh, things get held up there. I think traditionally, it's been beef, pork, poultry products like that, not necessarily chips and sauces and what have you, but um, not just from an agricultural standpoint, but anything can get held up, auto parts or paper or whatever you could be sending, right? So it's really good to have all your documentation clean ahead of time, work with a shipping company or a broker who can help you get things through. But I think in Japan, if you want to compare against Japan, if your paperwork and everything is clean, things will generally <coughs> sail through in Japan, generally. But in Korea, can still be held up. And on a personal note, I'm not just a lawyer. I actually been involved in several food businesses, one of which did the first live lobster exports uh, via the big island of Hawaii into the Korean market. And the second one was a dairy-related company. And to be frank, 
it went better than we expected and it helped us ultimately uh, exit from, from the company, we ultimately sold the company. So don't be discouraged. The food market is huge there. And unlike Japan, Koreans, I think, are a bit more receptive to, to foreign food products, although they're, they're also very picky, but probably not at quite the highest standard Japan is. And they are very picky about uh, Chinese agricultural products, which have flooded Korea, which, has a, which have a very negative reputation. So things out of Hawaii or from environmentally clean places in general will, will get support and, and less likely to run, in, run into you know, big issues, particularly if you're a smaller and mid-sized company. A good comparison for you might be to see what the New Zealand uh, food industry has done in Korea. And they've been extraordinarily successful, and uh, both in terms of large uh, you know, large exporters, but also a lot of small and medium-sized companies. That's true. <clears throat> That's true. New Zealand th also has a free trade agreement with Korea. I, I think you have a, you have an advantage here, Jimmy, be, be, <clears throat> because as Tom said, we have a reputation in Hawaii of having very clean air, water, soil, what have you. So products from here generally have a very good reputation. Any more questions before we move on? Well, let me add on a little to that. Uh, when we first passed the chorus agreement, uh, to be honest with you, a lot of uh, people in the lower ranks of the Korean government were not happy. And there is a lot of autonomy out in customs. So one of the things we ran into right off the bat was with McDonald's because they were trying to put the tariff on their french fries. And they were doing that because they said you had to prove that every potato came from the US. And literally, it held up for quite a few months. But we worked with the US Embassy and finally got that resolved. So it, it can be difficult. And remember that there is a lot of autonomy at these small stations and customs. So you just have to be prepared and then seek help if that happens. Well, my name is Pat Gaines, and uh, I'm glad to be here. And my presentation is, yeah, what Adrian said, because his presentation was so thorough. Um, you know, when I sit in the front of a group like this, I'm reminded of a story about a professor. And the, the professor was a world-known physicist. And after he retired, he went on the speaking circuit. And so he would go to universities and give presentations. Well, he had been doing this for about three years. And he had a driver who would pick him up, drive him to the event, and then come in and sit in the audience, and he would give the event. So one night, he's driving, and the professor is kind of complaining and saying, you know, I really don't want to do this. And the driver says, you know, what is the problem? All you do is speak. And he says, well, you think it's so easy? Why don't you do it? <laughs> so he says, OK, I will. So they traded uh, the tuxedo and the hat and went in to do the speech. And the driver got up on stage. And he just nailed the presentation. He had heard it so many times, he knew it word for word. <laughs> so then it came time for questions. And the professor was sitting in the front row and said, this should be fun. Well, the guy had heard so many questions, he nailed every question. <laughs> and the professor's kind of shaking his head. Well, finally, a graduate student in the back comes up with a PhD level question that was just unbelievable. And the professor sat in the front, and he started kind of chuckling to himself. And the driver hesitated a little bit. And then he said, you know, that question is so easy even my driver can answer it. <laughs> so if you ask me a top one, I'm going to look at Bill and say, Bill, you got to do this. That's great. So what I would say about Korea is, um, first of all, I flew there back in 82. And to see the changes that have occurred are just amazing. At that time in 82, I think there were six bridges across the Han River. I think now there's probably 40 at least. And part of the, the reason I bring that up is because if the Korean government wants to do something, it will happen. And it will happen very, very quickly. But I will also say if they don't want to do something, 
it won't happen. And it will take you a long time to get through uh, issues with the government and the bureaucracy. Um, the thing I'd like to emphasize is, and, and I won't take much time because I'd really like to open it up for more questions, is use the commercial officer at the embassy. More than anything else, we found that that was a resource that could help break down barriers. And it really did. You know, as chairman of the American Chamber over there, I was there, uh, my first two years were spent lobbying for the chorus agreement. And trust me, even, it was harder to get it through the U.S. Congress than it was to get it through the Korean Assembly. It actually went through very smoothly. Now, that doesn't mean there weren't protests. I mean, if you've been to Korea, you know that Koreans do love to protest. So we had a couple hundred thousand people protesting the Chorus Free Trade Agreement uh, for over a week. But when it went through, it made significant difference, and especially in the agriculture sector. Uh, the other thing is a lot of people thought that, uh, you know, the car industry was having troubles over there. Part of the reason was they didn't understand the Korean market and they didn't understand that service is so critical in Korea. And so they had to change their model to be able to really be successful. Um, it's interesting when you look back at Chorus, before the free trade agreement, if you were to buy a bottle of, say, Chateau Saint Michel wine that here would be $16, in Korea it was 78. After the free trade agreement, all that went away. And so it really did make a big difference. And it also opened up a lot of the avenues in the legal sector, in the banking sector, the services sector. But another point that Bill brought up, quality is extremely important in Korea. Walmart failed. And Walmart failed because they weren't seen as quality. They were seen as cheap, whereas Costco has done extremely well because Costco is known for the quality. In fact, the one main store in Seoul is the largest grossing Costco in the world. So it's amazing. When they see quality, they're definitely willing to pay for it. Uh, the last thing I'll talk about real quick is just one of the points that Bill brought up on North Korea. Um, I was fortunate to have dinner with the Minister of Finance uh, one night, and we were talking about reunification. And the population really is still pretty split. There's a lot of people that think the tax burden would be too high. There's all kinds of issues with it. But when I was talking to the minister, I said, you know, how do you address this issue of what the cost would be? And he said, I believe we would actually pay for itself within three years. He said, first of all, we need the workforce. He says, and they have 24 million people that we could use as workers because we import a lot of our labor from Philippines, from India, from Pakistan. He says, so we need the workers. He goes, second of all, he says, there are a lot of rich North Koreans. He says, not a lot, but he says, there's a big group up there that wants what we make. And he goes, so it would open up a whole new market to us. He said, but finally, we could then open up the railroad that we've already built to go up through North Korea. And that would allow them to transport product by rail all the way to Europe. And he said, the economic benefit of that is so high that we would pay for this whole deal within three years. So it's just an interesting point to you, uh, but I will concur with Bill that you never feel it when you're there doing business. Um, you know, we were watching, I was there when they bombed the island, you know, they shot artillery and killed four people on the one small island. I was there when they did two nuclear tests and missile tests, and Wolf Blitzer was on CNN saying this is the most dangerous place in the world. And we were all looking at each other as we were standing in line for a nice French restaurant saying, I wonder where he's talking about. Mm -hmm. So you really never did feel it at all. So it, it's a great business environment, a great place to do business. It does have challenges, but most of those challenges you can work through. Great. 
Before we get to um, Ryan's uh, UPS logistics talk, I'd like to ask you two a question because you're um, past chairman of AmCham. Oh yeah, AmCham in Korea. So um, that was the first chamber of commerce outside of the US that I joined when I was just a young pup sent to live in Korea. And I found it incredibly effective as other chambers that I joined throughout Asia how could a small company from Hawaii use the Chamber of Commerce in Korea? Can a small company now be a member, or what are the resources that are available there? So, small companies are definitely great candidates to use Amazon. Uh, one of the first things I would do when you get into country is contact the Amcham. They have committees that help uh, small businesses in particular and how to break down barriers on some of the pitfalls that occur when you're there. Um, we had about 2,000 members when I was chairman and many of them were actually very small businesses from the U.S. that came in. And there's also a lot of Korean businesses that do business with the U.S. that are in there. So it's it's a... Uh, it's a resource for you to seek out. And they have probably seen just about everything. I mean, if, if there's a problem that's occurred, we usually had it documented and knew about it and what we did to re resolve it. So between the commercial officer at the embassy and uh, American Chamber of Commerce, those are two great resources to use. And you can be a non-resident member too. That goes for other countries, right? If, if you're operating in Japan, for example, I recommend b being a member of the American Chamber of Commerce in Tokyo. There's also one in Osaka. So the American Chambers, they operate independently in these different countries, and um, they, they, they're separate organizations sort of under the umbrella of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, but they're quite independent. And so just because you're a member of Korea, doesn't mean you're a member of the American Chamber of Commerce in Brazil or what have you. They're, they're quite different. But if you're operating in these markets, it's a great opportunity to get in and network with people and talk to people who have had similar problems than the ones you're having. If, if you've been to these seminars before, you've heard me say that I meet so many companies here that feel like they're the first company in, in all of Hawaii uh, to ever try to export to Korea, or they're the first one to ever try to export to Japan. But they're not. There's lots of other companies who have tried it before, and you can learn from them. And it's silly not to try to learn from them already. Sorry, there's a, oh, hey, Gilmore. How and this is, this is Tom Panansky. I'll jump into it. And, and the chambers themselves actually evolve substantially as the countries evolve. So I know like when Bill first got there, and I was there at the time too, there used to be a much larger expatriate com component or American citizens actually working on the ground. As countries become very developed and more advanced, like Korea has, the nature of the type of, of the chamber does change considerably, and it changes fast. So um, it's a good idea to figure out what your needs are, and there has, everybody's kept mentioned, there are lots of different resources, and you're well advised, if, you know, you'll, you'll figure it out depending on what type of company and business you are, what's gonna be most helpful and useful to you. So one of the questions here from the audience is, what is the cost to be a member? And it varies by chamber, and each chamber will have a structure. So if you were, say, Boeing, for example, you're going to pay more than if you're like, uh, you know, Fred's, uh, uh, a moo moo shop, right? That's gonna, you're gonna pay more. I would say it's more like a couple hundred dollars a year for a company from Hawaii to join. Whereas if you're Boeing or you're Coca Cola or something like that, you're gonna pay several thousand dollars. To join. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, it, it's over 3,000 in Korea and, it, and it's a little uh, Korean, but each, each chamber has totally different dues structures. So, um, but there are um, non-resident memberships available. Those tend to be very inexpensive, but not utilized much. But um, you know, it would depend. But those are certainly um, the most affordable. But dues, like everything, dues have gone up a lot. Sure, 
Sure. So okay. you can find that it's all accessible on, on their on their website. So if you go to the, the chamber websites in the various countries, usually they'll post news information. Okay. So, Tom, if you don't mind, if if you could go ahead with your general comments, um, that would be wonderful. And then after that, we'll we'll have UPS present. And, and like Pat, by the way, Pat, good to hear your voice again. Uh, I'll keep it really brief. I'll just make three points. But, well, and first, I'll introduce myself. So I'm Tom Panansky. I'm still a indeed a very active partner at Barron Law, which is the newest of Korea's large law firms. We have about 200 lawyers on the ground in Seoul. Uh, I'm chair of our corporate department and also co-chair of our international arbitration department at the firm. I am calling in today from the beautiful coast of Maine, uh, where it's a glorious uh, afternoon. But just on a personal note, I've been a part-time resident of the, of the equally glorious north coast of Hawaii for some 25 years. And I do spend a lot of time in Hawaii, and I've actually represented a number of Hawaii businesses, and, including uh, government agents, uh, state government agencies, in related to Korea matters. I'll just make three, um, three quick points, and I hope you can hear me well. Um, and th I don't mean this to be self-serving, but I think early in the process, if you do make contact with a law firm or you know, a legal person that you're comfortable with, even if you don't need legal services at the time, and someone that's not gonna charge you just to talk to them, so that you have a, a a comfortable advisor that's at the ready in case things develop. I think that's really important because when you're talking about Korea, everything is different for you. Not just the language, the legal system itself. It's not a common law system which is prevalent in the United States or Canada or most other countries you might be doing business with already. It's a civil code system. And the culture, of course, is extremely different. And the microculture, the difference between if you're counterparty is say under 40 or over 40 if you're dealing with a large sophisticated Korean company or a family-owned company these differences are extreme and and it can be very helpful to have somebody or you know a group of advisors that have been on the ground a long time that can help guide you when called upon um, basic legal things to check on uh, if you have intellectual property and it's not protected it's an easy thing to do to get your trademark registered or something like that before you enter the market. So many, uh, particularly small and medium-sized companies will reach out through the commercial service, they'll find some partners, they'll start exporting, but they never thought to register their marks, and then they find out their counterparties have done it for them, which then leads to an issue about how they get the mark back. So try to avoid that kind of thing. Sorry, sorry uh, Tom, Tom, I just have to interrupt real quick and remind the audience that we have a couple presentation seminars in our archive particularly about that issue, uh, particularly focused on Japan and Korea and getting your trademark straightened out before you start exporting there. So please look at the HPEC archive on uh, IP protection. Sorry, Tom, please proceed. No, no, that's good. I'm glad you pointed it out because it, it does come up with great frequency. And um, again, if you uh, have somebody you're comfortable with, you can contact, you can get it registered, you know, you can do that. Uh, quite easily and for a very modest cost. Um, of course, we do that, among many other things. And then payment issues. I think this is really important for first-time exporters. Uh, Korea is a market where uh, things can move incredibly quickly. That can be extremely positive, and it can be extremely negative, and sometimes even extremely positive can be negative, meaning it, we see this a lot where a company will make a, an initial sample sale, it'll go well, and then suddenly they get a really large order. And for a small and medium-sized company, that can be enormously exciting, but also a great challenge and possibly a threat. So you need to be very careful that you're getting paid as you go along and be very wary of an, you know, a, a sudden order, which is much larger in volume or size than what you had before. And be especially wary if the payment structure changes. If you're moving away from an LC where they're asking for the certain you know, payment terms or credit or other types of things, which may make payment more risky for you. So, I mean, that's a great problem to have. In Korea, often what happens when something is well received, they want to move quickly because they want to move a lot of product very, very quickly. That's a great thing, but just be very careful that you manage. Um, you know, payment issues and the ability to continue to supply product at the quality that's expected. It's been mentioned a lot of times here how quality conscious Korean consumers are and how they're willing to pay a premium for that. 
That's all true. But your company's reputation, as quickly as it can be hot and strong and exciting, it can be ruined very, very quickly because Korea is now very much an online marketplace. Everything is, is circulating, including rumors and reputations about companies online. So you want to be very careful that uh, you, you get good reviews and nothing uh, unexpected comes up that could be spread like wildfire on the internet and devastate your company overnight. And that does happen. Um, so those are my three main points. Um, good to have a comfortable legal person, and, and for that matter, a banker or an accountant, at least be aware of someone so you don't have to scramble for that at the last minute. Someone you've already reached out to and had a chat with, you know, just in an introductory, introductory way. Uh, get your IP in order to make sure that's not going to be an issue. And payment issues, you know, be careful. You know, everybody wants to get paid. So don't let the incredible opportunity that might be in front of you cloud your judgment about being careful about getting paid um, and, and extending credit where you normally wouldn't have done so. Those are my points. I know we're running late, so I'll be happy to respond to any questions later as well. Sure. Um, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm going to beat the same drum again, and I apologize. In our video archive, you will find seminars specifically addressing finance, export finance, that sort of thing that Tom addressed. But we also have some very specific seminars on scaling up operations should you get a large order. And Innovate Hawaii here, uh, part of HTDC, works closely with DBED, and they have grants that can support you on uh, that particular topic. If you get a large order, how can you scale up quickly, maintain quality, and still maintain profitability? There's some great seminars um, very particular to that topic, so please look for those in the archive. With that, are there any questions for Tom before we move on? Okay, great. Tom, if you could hang on till the very end. Oh, where, sorry. Oh, Gilmore, please. I will. We got one. Oh, we'll we'll make Tom's contact information available. Okay, um, with that, then we'll move forward, and we'll have Ryan Sakai from UPS is here to talk about logistics. As you all know, we're out here uh, on a, some small islands in the middle of the ocean, and shipping is not necessarily easy. Uh, although Ryan will take some of our pain away, so we'll please talk about Ryan. Hopefully. So good morning, everyone. My name is Ryan Sakai. I am a UPS account manager here in Hawaii. I have been working with UPS for about six years now. I first started in Los Angeles, and two years, two years later, I transferred back home. So very lucky to work for a mainline company and then move back home to Hawaii. Uh, thank you, Rob, for the opportunity to talk about exporting with UPS to Korea today. Um, next slide. So before I get into the details of exporting to Korea, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background information about UPS. We are the largest carrier in the world. We ship about 2.5 million packages every day globally. Now, for the purpose of this comp or excuse me, for the purpose of this presentation, I will only be highlighting the UPS small package side of UPS. So that's basically anything that can fit into the UPS brown truck. I have some of the package limitations here. So one package, max weight 150 pounds, longest dimension 108 inches in length, which is about nine feet. So I don't think anyone here is shipping 150 pounds for one package or 108 inches, nine feet. Um, that might also go freight. Uh, next slide. So here we have a tool call our UPS Calculate Time and Cost, and this tool can help you determine what service you will utilize going to Korea. And this tool can be accessed via ups.com, and it's free to utilize. And for the purpose of this presentation, I chose Yongsung Gu 04303 South Korea. And all you'll need to you, the only information you'll need for this tool is the zip code and city in which you'll be shipping to and then that will determine which services we have to offer to that specific area. So specifically to this region, or this city and zip code, we offer three services. We offer a Worldwide Express, which is if you drop off your packages on a Monday, it will be delivered Thursday that same week at 12 p.m. noon. 
we have our worldwide saber, which again dropped off on Monday, delivered by Thursday that same week, end of business day. And then lastly, we have our worldwide expedited service, dropped off on a Monday, delivered the following Monday by end of business day. Now this is all pending customs clearance, and I'll get into more detail of that customs clearance process and how to prepare for that. Next slide. So you wish to export to Korea. Um, first, you have to ask yourself, is my product even exportable to Korea? What are the regulations and licenses required that I need to export into Korea? So shipping throughout the world, different countries require different regulations, licenses, and it's up to you as a shipper to know this information. Knowledge is powerful, knowledge is key, so that you go through these obstacles up front here in Hawaii rather than have your package in customs delayed saying, oh, we need this license now, we need this um, information from you. So UPS has a tool to equip you with this knowledge called UPS Tradeability. And UPS Tradeability is a free tool that can be accessed via UPS.com. And with this UPS Tradeability tool, you can determine if your product is exportable, what types of licenses or requirements are needed to export to Korea. And it can be found on the shipping tab of UPS. Um, some instructions here, Rob can forward this presentation onward afterwards. Uh, next slide, please. So again, this UPS tradability tool not only can determine if your product is exportable, it can help you identify harmonized tariff codes. And these harmonized tariff codes are the HS codes that in which Rob was referring to earlier. And this HS, or harmonized tariff code, is a code that's assessed or assigned to your product based on the commodity. And from there, that's where duties and taxes will be assessed based on, again, on that commodity and harmonized tariff code. UPS tradability also will help you estimate landed costs, which is another way of saying duties and taxes of your international shipments. A couple other great things that UPS tradability does um, up there. Next slide. Here is a screenshot of the restricted items to Korea, and this is a screenshot from our UPS tradability tool. So as you can see here, there are some obvious examples and commodities like guns, knives, um, negotiable bonds, you can't send any currency. So again, this can be found on UPS Tradeability, which is a free tool via UPS.com. So now that your product is exportable to Korea and it's okay to ship, one thing that's required is a commercial invoice. Now, in simpler terms, a commercial invoice is a passport for your package. Now recently, I traveled to London about a few weeks ago, and I brought my passport with me. And my passport helped clear me through customs so that I could enter the UK. Your commercial invoice acts as the same thing, but for your package. So it's important that this commercial invoice is detailed and descriptive as much as possible so that there are no delays when entering Korea or entering that country. So for example, if I had my passport in London and my passport was blank or missing information, most definitely, I would get pulled aside from customs and saying, hey, who are you? Why is there missing information here? Where are you from? Now, same thing for this commercial invoice. If you're missing information on here and you don't have descriptive details in this commercial invoice, more than likely your package will get delayed from customs and they would say, we need to find out more information. And your customer will not like delays. You will, as a shipper, will not like delays. And then us as a carrier, we don't like delays either. So delays, not good. This goes for any international shipment, whether you're shipping to Brazil or Canada or wherever. But uh, Korea is one of those countries where they're looking for errors in your commercial invoice. They're looking for a reason to give you some trouble. So the cleaner this is, the easier it's going to be for you. Thanks, Rob. And UPS has two ways you can ship your packages via UPS.com or UPS World Ship software. And when you're processing a shipment internationally, UPS will actually walk you through on how to fill out this commercial invoice. But again, my advice to you is to be as descriptive as possible so that you will avoid delays when moving through customs. I really like your description of it's a passport for your package. That's a very good way to think about it. Yeah, it's my 101. Get, your, get your visas straightened out ahead of time. 
So after you fill out the commercial invoice, three copies of this commercial invoice has to be attached and accompanied to your package when shipping abroad. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, thank you. Oh, go back. Sorry. UPS has a solution called UPS Paperless Commercial Invoices. So instead of printing out the three copies of the invoice, this data and this information is transmitted electronically to the destination country. Now there's, there's a couple benefits to this. The first benefit, of course, is the environmental impact. You no longer have to print out those three copies per that one package. Secondly, this information, again, is transmitted electronically in real time to that destination country. Now this pre-alerts that destination country that your package is on its way. And that pre-alert, that proactive notification will help reduce customs holds by up to 52%. And this is a solution that UPS offers in which you have to sign up for. So you can see me after if, if, if you would like to find out more information about this. So your product is now in transit, now what? So when you ship through UPS, our UPS rates include brokerage services. So you do not need your own broker to broker the packages. Now what's a broker? A broker is a professional agent who acts on your behalf to clear your packages through customs. UPS broker ensures that all documentation is submitted to customs and they have the local knowledge of that country to make sure your product is cleared through customs. The benefit of UPS is that we have a wealth of knowledge and experience over 80 plus years in 60 plus countries. 97% of packages are all cleared the same day. Again, the quicker your packages are cleared in transit, the more successful, the more happy, the greater your customer experience will be, especially abroad. I just wanted to touch on some of the tips that I have and I give a lot of my customers who ship internationally here from Hawaii. So I would say a majority of folks, if not all, if you're shipping internationally, you most definitely or probably have an e-commerce presence, an online website, marketplace. Now here's five ways that can help improve your customer's online experience internationally. The first two I believe are, are the most important that I always highlight. The first one is localizing your customer's experience. Now, now that comes in two forms, or a couple forms, but I'll highlight two. Localizing your customer's experience. So when they are about to check out on your website, they can go to the address field of the ship to on where their address is located. It's important that their address format is formatted based on the country that they're living in. So for example, if you're shipping to Korea and a Korean, a Korean address is formatted differently than an address in the States. So if your customer is trying to fill out the ship to information but it says city state address and there's no province section, there's no precinct section, more than likely your customer will not buy from you because it's not local. Secondly, you can also localize your customer's experience by changing the currency of your product on your website to their specific currency. So for Korea, if you can change it to the South Korean won, more power to you on their website. Secondly, illustrating fully landed costs up front to eliminate unexpected charges. So fully landed costs are your duties and taxes that your customer has to pay, which is based on the commodity and the value of your product. So if you can show these charges or at least estimate it up front, your customers have that knowledge and know what to pay when they receive their product and have to pay duties and taxes. That's a very important point though. I mean, if you were, just put yourself in your customer's shoes. If you were ordering something from amazon.com and it said it costs $100, you say, okay, I'll pay $100, you click. And then the package arrives here in Honolulu and um, the driver do drops it off but says, oh, you still have to pay another $27 in taxes and fees and delivery fees and what have you. Wouldn't you be kind of upset about that? So it's the flip side. If your customer is in Korea, they want to know what is the price to just get it to their office or get it to their door. They don't care about what really is the customs fees and the delivery fees and all of this other stuff. They just want the landed cost. And the more you can make that extremely clear, the easier it is for your customers to buy from you and have a positive interaction with your organization. Yeah, and on that note, if let's say for example, you, your customer does buy something from you and they thought they paid all of the fees up front, 
to you. And when our driver goes to deliver their package and they have to pay an extra $27 in duties and taxes and they don't want to pay for that, that package is coming back to you as a shipper. And then you have to pay for shipping going there. And then you also have to pay for shipping coming back. And then you have a product that's maybe no longer sellable. So again, illustrating duties and taxes up front is key to a successful customer experience internationally. Um, UPS is partnering up with a company called Zonos in which they provide a plug-in tool to a lot of the big shopping carts, the, the big online shopping carts like Magento, e uh, Magento, Shopify, um, big cart, I think. Um, but anyways, it will help localize your customer's experience based on the IP address that your customer is viewing, in whichever country your customer is viewing your website from. Now here is an example of a company called Flavor West, and this customer is viewing Flavor West's website from Portugal. A pop-up window shows up and says, thank you for visiting us from, from Portugal. We offer, the, we offer the following services in Portuguese, see total, total and pay in your currency, option to prepay duties and taxes up front, and multiple shipping options available. Uh, next slide. And here is a screenshot of the checkout from our Zonos partner. And as you can see here on the shipping address, this is based on a Brazilian format address. So it's not based on an address based in the States. Again, localization is huge and key. On the right-hand side, you'll see duties and taxes listed along with the total charges of the commodity or product and the shipping charges. Having these landed costs up front, again, is key to a successful customer experience abroad. And they have it in that Brazilian uh, currency. Uh, next slide. UPS recently approved new rates for shipping to Korea and abroad. Um, if you are currently shipping to Korea or abroad globally, um, or if you're thinking about shipping soon, please let me know. I'll be sticking around, and we'd be more than happy to talk about these rates and hopefully have you shipping with UPS. Any questions? So we're really shipping you know, small amounts of freight to Japan. Um, if we ship to Japan and keep it in a uh, foreign trade zone, um, would, make, would shipping UPS parcel from there to Korea make, make sense, or would just the rates shipping direct from Hawaii that's a good question and it all depends on the rate coming out of Japan of course versus the rate coming out of here and unfortunately at this time I do not have the rates coming from Japan going to Korea but I do or I am familiar with the rates coming out of Hawaii to Korea but um, if you can shoot me an email we'd be definitely more than happy to follow up with you on that Jimmy you're sure it's in a foreign trade zone you're absolutely sure? Because what could happen is if it becomes a pro once it gets shipped to Japan, it clears customs in Japan. It's now a product of Japan. So if you ship it to Korea, you're missing out on all of the free trade agreement between the U.S. and Korea, right? So these are the... It would, it would, yeah, we, what we have to do is um, set up, set up, um, set up the, the ship that does go to a foreign trade zone in Japan hmm. and hold it there. Um, so it's something that... It's possible, certainly. Yeah, but, but again, I mean, is that extra step for setting up cost savings? <coughs> so I guess, like to your point, you know, you gotta you gotta know what the cost of Korea, Japan to Korea is. But in in theory, it should be cheaper because of the, it's closer. You know, sure. you know, yeah, and with more probably more flight. Yeah, and everything goes to that. You, uh, research that uh, closely. Okay. It's, I won't go any further than that, but I mean, you know, be very careful of, of um, that, even though it's a short distance, uh -huh. 
could be a long could be more. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on should go more? Uh, is the commercial invoices needed on samples that you give on a commercial flight over there versus shipping You mean carrying it? Yeah. Um, you should have one with you in case when you're walking through customs, they say, hey, buddy, uh, let me look in your bag. And they open up your bag and all of a sudden you have all of these samples, right? That you could, what they're trying to make sure is you don't sell those samples there and not pay tax on whatever income you're generating. So, well... Still though, if even under a free trade agreement, if you're selling product in Korea, your distributor, whoever is marking up the product and they're gonna pay sales tax on that locally, right? And by just taking it in and selling it, you're subverting that process, right? So that's what they're... So is this commercial invoice like a, a, a set type of standard document? Yeah. Absolutely, and there, you can clearly state on there, these are samples for sale, and I will take them back out of the country with me. So as a U.S. commercial service export, do you provide a template of that commercial invoice? Or no, if you just Google commercial invoice template, there'll be one, but certainly you could get one from UPS or any freight forward company. They would, they would have templates for you to use. It's a standard thing. I mean, if you're a, if you're a German company, shipping product to the USA, you still have to have a commercial invoice. They, globally, they're all basically have the same information on it. Yeah, and then when you're shipping with UPS, there are specific fields that you have to fill out in the commercial invoice, and it will not let you proceed until you fill out those specific areas. And again, the more detailed you are, the better for you, so that to avoid delays for your product. Yep, I think that's it. Hi, hey, how are you? Uh, you can ask question for, sure. um, for certain products that may require more than just a commercial invoice, like a certification that the material is non hazardous and doesn't contain ingredients. Does UPS offer any assistance in that area? So, as far as your commodity, that's all up to the shipper to determine what information is needed to accompany your package or your commodity to that specific country. But again, we do have that tool, UPS Tradeability, in which you can look up your commodity and see what is required, what is needed for it to enter that country. We also have an international department that's more than happy to assist you, and along with myself as one of the account managers here in Hawaii. So, when, when Tom Panansky was speaking, he said he recommends highly that everybody has a banker and a lawyer know who that is so you can ask them questions. Uh, and I firmly recommend you should know who your shipping person is. So if you were to use UPS, know Ryan ahead of time and work with him on your packaging and how you ship the product and what is in the product and whatever. Don't call him uh, the day that you're planning to ship the product. Call him months in advance to work out all of those things ahead of time. It's much better to do these things early than to do them the day of uh, shipping. Sure. Yeah, uh, um, material data sheet is important if you're sending that type of product course. Hi, Maggie. Oh, the solution? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, uh, if you want to call... Let's see if I can slides. bring it. Can you grab the mic? Oh. Okay. So, Zonos is a company that's partnered up with UPS, and this is a plug-in tool that plugs into your shopping cart and Again, they are partnered up with a lot of the major shopping carts, the Shopify's, the big commerces, the Magento's, um, to provide that address localized or that localization, that localization based on what country your customer is viewing your website from, 
based on their IP address. So whether it be Korea, whether it be Japan, whether it be Portugal, Brazil, it'll identify based on their IP address where they're viewing that product from. And UPS is partnered up with this company, so we do have exclusive pricing for UPS customers for this Zonos solution. So that's a good question. So if you want to pull that next slide. So duties and taxes would be on this Zonos platform. Yeah, so it's, it's actually line item on this right-hand side. It's a little blurry. But you have your cart subtotal, which is the cost of your commodity. You have your UPS saver, which is our service, and that cost as well. And then you have your duties and taxes, which is line item over there. And, and with Zonos, they have the option to pay duties and taxes up front or your customer can pay dues and taxes at the door. But again, giving this information up front is key so that, back to the Amazon example, your customer is aware of this extra charge coming to them. Any more questions for Ryan? Okay, great. Thank you, Ryan. That was great. Um, what I'd like to do very briefly, maybe not so briefly, but let's get the panels panelists involved, and Tom and Adrian, if, if you're still on, uh, and you two gentlemen have spent a lot of time in Korea. Let's talk about the business culture in Korea. And I can see you smiling. <laughs> Let's just talk about how uh, different it is. Most of our small companies in Hawaii will, if they're exporting, they probably have a little experience with Japan. So I'm going to unfairly ask you to compare with what you might know about how things are done in Japan with how is business done in Korea uh, from a cultural standpoint, personal standpoint, when you're first meeting people, what are negotiations like? Uh, let's, let's just talk about that for, for a minute. If you want, this is Tom, I'm still on the line. I can make this too quick. Uh, two quick things in here, or at least one. Uh, I think the biggest difference, you're going to feel it as soon as you get on a Korean Air flight, is the culture of impatience. It's very different than Hawaii, and particularly very different from Kauai, where I spend most of my time in Hawaii. Things happen fast, and the expectations are that things will happen fast. And the expectations are, like, really, really, really fast, which means that may be very different to the way you're conducting business in Hawaii. Um, so emails are expected to be answered, but emails are actually pretty passe. If any, you, know, you might want to download a Kakao app so you can message to uh, you know the Korea's biggest messaging service, or, and uh, and just be. The other big difference, if you want to compare with Japan, is Koreans tend to be very direct. There's not a lot of indirect dancing. They'll get right to the point pretty often, and sometimes that may strike people as a little rude, but usually it's not, and often it makes it a little bit actually easier. Uh, once you build a relationship with somebody to you know, know where they're coming from. Building the relationship like in Japan, though, can take a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of physical uh, visits and that kind of thing. But, but the single biggest one that jumps out of me, and particularly because I've actually done business in Hawaii, too, is just the speed. I'll give you one example. You're building a rail project, a light rail project in, uh, in Honolulu right now. I, I represented Bombardier Transportation when they built the state-of-the-art driver, driverless light rail project for the southern suburbs of Seoul, the Yongin area. It took seven years from concept, actually six and a half, uh, to signing ceremony with the, you know, the Canadian ambassador and everybody else, completely done. And in the middle of that, there was a huge international arbitration with a $600 million judgment. All of that happened from beginning to completion of project it is now up and running in six and a half years. And I'm sure, you know, Bill and, and Pat, you know, with Boeing, they can give you a little idea how fast the Incheon International Airport got built, where the United States has not built a Greenfield International Airport since Denver in the 1980s. So things happen fast. So hold on to your seat and expect that other people expect you to respond quickly. And if they don't, they usually move on to the next person that will. <clears throat> That's fair. Uh, I don't have a lot. I don't have a lot of experience in, in uh, Japan, other than living close to it for a long period of time. But um, use the microphone. what I do remember, if it makes any, yeah, if it makes any sense, 
is um, when we would get together from a Boeing point of view with our counterparts in each each country had a had a, um, a reigning president so to speak and um, my Japanese counterpart <clears throat> my Boeing um, American Japanese counterpart would explain how things were done in Japan and then he would look over at me and I'm just shaking my head and I go and he'd ask me why he says well that's not the way it's done in, in Korea um, there is distinct differences and just as Tom pointed out um, one of the things is um, Koreans are from, from in comparison with Japan and and perhaps even elsewhere they're much more direct um, it's not it's not as uh, circuitous a route from the relationship point of view. It can be established much, much faster. Um, as far as the, um, the courtesies and all of that, it's about what you expect. Um, I can't think of anything that's unique. Pat? Well, I've uh, negotiated contracts in both countries. Um, the real big difference I saw, the Japanese were a lot more, uh, once you had an agreement, it was an agreement. And the biggest problem in Japan was they wouldn't really express their opinions. Uh, they didn't want to insult you. So they may not agree with what you were trying to propose, but they wouldn't tell you um, because they were too polite. That is not the case in Korea. <laughs> They will definitely tell you. The other thing I would say about negotiating contracts in Korea, uh, if it's with a large Korean firm, uh, there's two things to remember. One is they truly do not believe in a win-win. If you win, they lose. And so that is kind of their negotiating style. They have to get something out of you, or they won't. We used to say that they would back you up to the edge of the cliff and finally, when you said, I can't take another step backwards, then they might give in. But they are very tough negotiators, very good business people. But when you go in, especially with a large corporation, remember that you have to have uh, stuff in your negotiation that you'll be able to give in on. Because one level will have to show that they got something out of you. And then the next level will have to show that they got something out of you. And then the chairman will have to get something too. So you have to posture your negotiation with that knowledge that uh, they're, they're very tough, very tough negotiators. But as Bill said, they're very upfront. They will tell you what they feel. Um, they have great negotiating skills. They'll keep you in a hot office and uh, have you sit out there in the heat for a long time and delay you. and. They, they are very skilled at negotiating. Is there still a lot of um, entertainment in the evenings? Is that going on if you're dealing with you know, people? There still is a lot of entertaining. Um, they, they like to go out. They like to socialize. They uh, like to drink soju. And, uh, and so that occurs. It's gotten better. Um, in, in, the, in the previous years, it was really bad. Uh, in fact, as, as a president of a company over there, you almost had to have your own designated drinker because otherwise they were gonna, everybody was going to come up and give you a toast, and so you had to work out ways to get around that. Um, but they are very social. They, they love to go out. They love to entertain you. They're very, very proud of their country and their culture. That's true. And they like to show it off. Yeah, that's true. Very proud. People. And I and I, I would add to what Pat just said. Yeah, it gets more and more sophisticated, literally year by year. So you're as likely to meet somebody now who wants to impress you with how expensive the wine he's ordered than force you to drink Boilermakers. And it really depends who your counterpart is. You know, it's so much varied, and also the age group that they're from. Mm. There's a huge difference between you know the older generation and the current generation. And the, and the industry you're in. If you're in a really high-tech industry or something like that, it's a totally different world. But yeah, social world, want to entertain, et cetera. But it takes on uh, many more forms now than it used to be almost uh, uh, you know, formulaic, what they would do. And uh, they won't bore you with that, what that was. But, uh, but know your counterparty. That'll, that'll help you also figure out what type of entertainment to expect or to enjoy. 
a lot of our uh, companies in Hawaii, small companies uh, that would be interested to export to Korea are run by women, owned by women. Uh, how, how is it for women uh, business people from Hawaii traveling to Korea? First of all, is it safe? And what is the environment that they're getting into? For example, I'll, I, it's a leading question because I, I know the answer, but uh, when I was young and just going to Korea around 1990, uh, there weren't a lot of women in business at that point. I know it's changed somewhat, but what's your opinion? I saw it. <clears throat> I saw a change in that period of time, too. Uh, for example, just like negotiating, initially, um, our company, we, we, I just would not allow uh, a woman to be on the negotiating team just because I knew that she was not going to be well received. That changed completely uh, from the point, uh, to the point when I finally left. Uh, we actually had at least one situation. I remember our lead negotiator was a lady, and it was not a problem. Pat? Yeah, I would agree with that completely. It has changed significantly in the last couple years. Uh, our main lawyer was uh, a female, and uh, she had absolutely no problem, except for her last name was, her first name was Kim. And so they all, all thought she was Korean because uh, she'd come into the room, but she was a blonde, tiny little gal, but tough as can be as a negotiator. The other question was, is it safe? Um, I will tell you, Seoul, Korea is probably the safest city I have ever been to in my life, even safer than Singapore. Um, we would have people lose their wallet in the taxi, come in, they'd go, oh my gosh, I lost my wallet, and we said, don't worry. And sure enough, taxi would call up, say, I have this guy's license, his wallet, bring it back. Um, you know, if you're there, you can go to a coffee shop and people will leave their purse on the table to go to the bathroom and nobody ever worries about it. Um, it, it is very, very safe environment. I, I would agree with that. And in terms of female, it does vary depending on the industry, the level of female participation and sort of decision making roles, uh, but it's increased markedly. Uh, they tend to be younger than the average male because they've come up to an environment that was very uh, male dominated. Um, but some industries have huge female participation. I'd also say multinationals were, of the big companies were much quicker to employ females in meaningful roles. And that just continues even at CEO roles at this point. So, and yeah, definitely a safe place. And even not for business, even just for leisure travel, it's a, it's a safe place to be, much like Japan. In that, in that regard. <clears throat> okay. One other quick comment I had on marketing in general is that if you are going to start marketing in Korea, social media will be uh, enormous for you, more so probably than it even is in the United States. The Koreans are uh, voracious uh, uh, users of social media, and social media that maybe we don't even have here in this country, uh, Line, for example, they have a very their own popular um, web browser or search engine in Korea called Naver. It's a big company uh, that is more popular than Google in Korea. Um, Kau Kau, somebody mentioned Kau Kau earlier as a social media platform and a chat function. So these are things that you're going to have to get used to. You can't just utilize um, sort of U.S. standard uh, Facebook and Instagram and what have you. There's a place for that, but there's other things for your products that might be more relevant and probably, may, maybe might isn't the right word, but are probably more relevant than just Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat and what have you. And so you should look at these Korean alternatives yeah, and it does go to the distribution. It goes to the distribution system as well. The way products are distributed now, you know, much like in the U.S., the likelihood of people walking into a department store gets less and less and less, and more and more age dependent. More and more people order their product and goods on their phone, and it comes directly to where they're physically present. And there are big Korean companies. There's a big unicorn called Coupang. You should be familiar with how they move products from outside of Korea into Korea. Um, it's you know pretty amazing. I mean, at the point where 
there were certain grocery items, you know, when I wanted in Seoul, uh, they would get shipped straight from a warehouse in California, straight to me. Uh, and that was thanks to the free trade agreement and other things like that. So um, it is, uh, you know, I think for the, the Commerce Department guys on the ground in Seoul would have a very good feel for that. But the way your product is actually distributed in the market is not under rapid transformation, particularly the last three or four years. And that allows you to ramp up even that much more faster, which also takes you back to some of the issues we discussed. That, that, that can be positive, but also can be a concern if it's not done properly. Okay. Just very quickly, I put up a map here. Tom and Adrian online probably can't see this map that I put up here, but I think a lot of people are surprised when they see this is the the DMZ right here, this is North Korea, South Korea. People I think are surprised when they see how, this is the Seoul metropolitan areas here, and how close Seoul is to the DMZ is actually quite remarkable, um, right in here. And then obviously as you get farther down in the south, this is culturally a bit different down here, different, slight, somewhat different foods and what have you, but I've often felt that a lot of the, our Hawaii products could be very good on this Jeju Island, which is like the honeymoon capital of Korea, the, a vacation capital, quite nice climate down there, but there's a lot of products that we could sell to Jeju Island and what have you, so very interesting country. Great people, great food. I highly recommend it, even if you go for vacation. But you could go there quite reasonably and do a marketing study um, rather inexpensively traveling around, seeing how your products and services fit into Korea. It's easy to drive um, there. When I first started driving in Korea, it was a bit like um, a NASCAR just going around the block, but now it's much more under control, easy to drive all around the country. The, the highway system is based on the, the U.S. interstate system, so it feels very familiar. It's uh, all on the right side of the road, not like the left side if you were traveling in Japan. All the signs are in, in Korean and in English, so it's quite an easy place to navigate, actually. Okay, we're going to wrap up soon. Are there any final comments or questions? Maggie. Yeah, uh, I th yes, the answer is yes, definitely. I would say that um, for Japan, J the Japanese have a more of an affinity to Hawaii than the Koreans do, but I think that that's just because in, in Korea, Hawaii isn't as known as well. But that's changing, and, and Hawaii is doing a good job of marketing Hawaii in Korea. As I said earlier, I think the Korean market is becoming much more organic-oriented in terms of foods and very health-conscious. Korean food, by and large, is quite healthy food anyway. Lots, there's not a lot of processed food in Korea. It's fairly single ingredient food, lots of vegetables and rice, uh, beef and pork and chicken and that sort of thing, but not a lot of processed food. And uh, I think that our, our uh, foods that we ship from here or the lotions and the creams and the oils and that sort of thing that are natural and uh, th that they have behind those products, the marketing of made with aloha with the sunshine and the beaches and the palm trees and the clean soil and air and what have you, that helps market in Korea a lot. And um, as I've talked to you before, what I think we need to do is a better job of marketing to the visitors that are coming here from these countries and then feeding that marketing back to their home domestic market so they can get the products that they tried here and enjoy, they can get those domestically back in Korea or Japan or Taiwan or China where they're visiting from. 
Does yeah, I would add, um, I think the Made in Hawaii is a very good marketing tool for Korea. Uh, Korea, ha Hawaii's become a lot more popular with the Korean population. Um, part of it is the fact that I live out on Koalina Golf Course, and we have the Lotte Golf Tournament for the LPGA there, and it's been coming on five years. So it gets huge visibility on Korean TV. And so I, I think that aspect, people do love Hawaii and Korea. And so branding it that way, I think, would help you. Mm -hmm. Please. I can't answer that. Just from my personal experience, as I would say, Taiwan would be hard to beat. Yeah, but, to but Korea could be close. Korea has a lot of female CEOs in the marketing arena. Mm -hmm. and it's because they are very sensitive to the changes that take place in the market. So if you wanted to market anything wide to Korea, I would suggest that you Oh, yeah. They will have, you know, there's a reason why, like, the uh, <clears throat> marketing people in Korean Airlines, their daughters, they have very good ties to uh, kind of the social stuff. The other one about your comment about uh, Paulina and the uh, and all that, uh, the biggest difference that made uh, Hawaii be more on the map is not because of the exposure that you've gotten, it's because of the uh, no visa policy. So Korea has always, Hawaii has always been on the Korean mind as a place mm -hmm. to go. In fact, you were talking about Jeju Island being the, uh, the uh, what is that, the uh, honeymoon the island. Yeah. It, it, it's actually here. And the visa was always a problem because there was a lot of stigma on how to get there. Mm -hmm. so once that disappeared, this place opened up like the volcano. I, mean, I think it's a perfect time for you guys, as people at companies a lot, to venture into Korea. Well, you have to remember, too, just to put it into perspective, Japan versus, um, versus Korea. <clears throat> In 19, as 1985, when I first got to uh, Korea, you had to be 35 years old to have a passport. That's because they, the country did not want to lose their foreign exchange, their uh, currency. And so consequently, you had to be 35 years old and go through a process just to get a passport to be able to leave the country. Of course, that all changed. And yeah, like Pat, who fought hard for uh, the U.S.-Korea free trade agreement, I was part of the delegation that would go every year and uh, lobby Washington for visa-free. Yeah, And that's made a, made a big difference. So it's been a it's been a short period of time where Koreans have now been allowed to travel. And there's also a difference in, in the concept of, Korea, uh, of Hawaii that I have found, and my wife, who is Korean, has found too. The um, <clears throat> Koreans all want to come to Hawaii, but they won't come back next year, probably. They will, they put it on their list to come back, but they got a whole bunch of other places they want to go first too, because they haven't had the chance to, to see the rest of the world. But they will, but they will come back. Yeah. And and Bill, I'll update you on Jeju Island. First of all, yeah, there are no more honeymoons in Korea because Korean women stopped getting married. That's the first. <laughs> one. Um, and anyway, they can travel anywhere. The lowest birth rate in the world, and Seoul as a major city uh, is becoming a child-free city. It's a very it's very bizarre, and it's a, it's actually a huge demographic issue. Um, so uh, that's one thing to keep in mind. What it has become, though, is a destination for mass Chinese tourism and some very unsavory Chinese investment as well. Um, so uh, Jeju is still a beautiful place, highly recommend it. But if you want to do business and make money in Korea, go to Seoul. <laughs> Definitely go to Seoul. That's where most of your businesses and decision making will be. And the logistics are so good, you can get anywhere in the country, either virtually or directly in person, very, very easily. So. Um, Sorry for the editorial comment. Great, no, great comment, thank you. Okay, any further questions? Any online questions before we wrap up? 
Okay, great. Then thank you everybody. Please help me uh, uh, thank everybody that was on the panel today. Adrian had to jump off and uh, he was there, but thank you. Thank you so much. So this uh, seminar concludes our high step programming for the year. And as Jamie mentioned, please stay tuned to your email or news announcements about what will be happening for the 2020 cycle. So thank you again. Have a good day. Uh -huh. Thank you for letting me be on the panel. I enjoyed it. I look forward to my next trip to Hawaii. Oh, Bye. Thank you, Tom. Great, Tom. Great talking to you again. Take it easy. Thanks, Bill.